traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. When we left off last episode, we were pulling on our silk underthings, strapping on a whole lot of leather, and getting ready to go about the rest of our Scythian day. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and do that before listening to this one. Otherwise, let's hop onto our horses and ride. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Mikkel, Jackie, Gaia, Anna, Wendy, Kayla, Jessica B, and Emily. My lady presidents, Caroline, Caitlin, Louisa, Amy, Brendan, Paul, Elizabeth G, Kat, Nancy, Eve, Kelly, Claire K, Courtney, Casey, Jordan, Debbie, Pamela, Sasha, Cassie, Townsend, Ellie, Jessica S, Meg, Edie, Audrey, Lauren, Karen R, Dana, Lori, Larissa, Belinda, Nicole, Claire S, and Elizabeth M. And here's to the gods and goddesses divine who are contributing more each month than I've asked for. Jackie C, Alexis, Karen C, and Avery. By becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month, you get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, and more. And help me keep the Explores going. To check it out, head to my website and click on Become a Patron. While we're trotting along, let's talk about a controversial and convoluted subject, our sex lives. The Greeks have a lot of contradicting views about them, and we need to return to the Amazon myths to make sense of it. If we're known for two things, it's sex and violence. Amazon's sexual appetite is described in one of two ways, at least in Greek literature. Some guys like Aeschylus call us maidens fearless in battle, so some scholars purport we're staunch and militant virgins. We tend to think of the word maiden as meaning untouched, but in ancient Greece it actually just means unmarried. There are several Greek goddesses who shun sex and kill men who try to steal their v-card. Artemis and Athena, who we met in our last bonus episode on Patreon, are two of the main ones. Perhaps one of the Amazon's nicknames, Androctones, or man-killers, stems from that. Some paint us as hating sex and everything associated with it. Jordanus says that among the Amazons, childbearing was detested, although everywhere else it is desired. Go jump off a cliff, Jordanus. And there's the rumor that Amazon women hate men so much that they kill baby boys when they're born, exposing them to the elements or maiming them. Others say the boys are handed off to be raised by fathers in separate settlements, supposedly because they value them less. So are the Scythians all battle-scarred bands of women warriors who sleep with men only for procreation and kill them directly afterwards? Unlikely. It is likely that some of these nomadic tribes see their menfolk right away to raid for long periods, Dothraki-like, and thus often have to fend for themselves. If an ancient Greek stumbles upon us in this state, it would be easy to see why he'd think we're an all-lady tribe. Some ancient writers make it seem as if Scythian men and women live separately, only coming together a few times a year to make babies and, if those babies are boys, hand them over to their fathers. But we don't have a lot of reason to believe this is so. It's also possible that some groups practice fosterage, the practice of exchanging kids between clans to form alliances between them. But let's face it, it's unlikely any Scythian women are throwing boys out of a proverbial window. Other writers offer up a different version of the Amazon sexscape. Several describe them as man-loving, not man-hating, painting them as wanton swingers who bed down in the grass with whomsoever they please. Herodotus gives us the following story. Long ago, before his time, a tribe of female Amazons were taken prisoner by the Greeks and put onto their ship. 
The Amazons, knowing they'd be turned into slaves, rose up, grabbed their spears, and killed them all. Because, obviously. Then landed the ship in Kremnoi on the Sea of Azov. They promptly found some horses and stole them, then went about pillaging all in sundry. The local Scythians, called the Royal Scythians, once lived a nomadic life, but had long since bedded down in semi-permanent settlements. And they were not best pleased with this band of feral foreign ladies, so they sent one of their young men on over to negotiate. But since they couldn't speak each other's language, progress was slow. Eventually, the Amazon woman made enough obscene hand gestures that the Scythian understood what she was trying to throw down. That she was up for some connubial communion if he was. So they made love instead of war, right there in the grass. Afterward, she used her skills with sign language to intimate that he should come back the next day and bring a friend, which of course he did. More friendly boinking ensued. For a while, the Amazons and these royal Scythians were happy just laying and playing together. The men never bothered to learn their language, but the women learned to speak some of theirs. Eventually, that first guy said, Hey babe, this whole nude orgy in the grass situation is super fun. But maybe you ladies could come on over to our place and settle down and make babies and bake bread and stuff. Or as Herodotus puts it, We have parents and property. We promise to keep you as our wives and we won't even take up with any other women. Really selling it there, Romeo. The Amazon replied, Impossible. We live to shoot arrows, throw javelins, and ride horses. Your women never leave home to hunt or explore or for any other reason. We would never be able to live like that. Fair enough, I say. The ladies proposed the men give up their settled lives of luxury and gallop away into the sunset with them. And the guys basically said, Okay, cool. That sounds hot. And together they formed a merry band called the Sarmatians, which were still roaming around in ancient Greek times. But how many of these casual carnal encounters are we actually having? It's hard to say. We migrate a lot, moving with the seasons, but tribes do come together in spring to bury the preserved remains of our loved ones and take nice, long, purifying saunas. We also mingle for trading purposes and compete in riding and shooting contests. All great opportunities to knock Scythian boots with someone new. And why limit yourself to just one, anyway? Strabo tells us that the women of the mountain tribes of Media in modern-day Iran believe it honorable to have as many men as possible and consider less than five a calamity. Herodotus tells us that the Agathirsi mate with whoever they feel like to help foster sibling-like relationships and to eliminate jealousy and hatred. The clan who gets new together stays together. And, of course, they may also see the wisdom in mixing up the gene pool a little, though they wouldn't think of it along those lines. Amongst the Masagate, whose queen we'll meet a little later, open marriage is a definite option if done discreetly. Instead of a sock on the door, the sign for Busy, please go away is a quiver sitting outside a lady's wagon. Slay, girl, slay! Herodotus tells us that Amazons do indeed get married and consider that a sign of a life well lived, but not before they prove themselves in battle. Pomponius Mella says that To kill the enemy is a woman's military duty, and virginity was the punishment for those who fail. The historian Alien says that amongst the Masagate, courtship itself is a battle. If a man wants to marry a maiden, he must fight a duel with her. They fight to win, but not to the death. If the girl wins, she carries him off as captive and has power and control over him. But if she is defeated, then she is under his control. This control is probably symbolic. Much like Atalanta, we women of the steppe are interested in finding a partner who is our equal. Nothing says, you get me, quite like a guy who isn't afraid to go against you in a savage wrestle. Couples are often buried together, equals even in the afterlife. All we can really be sure of is that Scythians are enjoying the pleasures of the flesh, either with one or several someones, and they're probably doing it way more on their own terms than any ancient Greek wife. And unlike them, Scythians can expect to be treated as their companions equal. This barbarian life is looking better by the minute. <laughs> Let's get into some violence, shall we? 
Though we tend to think of Scythians mid-battle, much of what we use our weapons for is hunting. In a life when we don't stop much to farm, meat features prominently in our diets. All sorts of hunting trophies have been found in Scythian graves, from boar's tusks to lion's claws, which shows how very far we can roam. We often take dogs along when we go hunting. We use eagles, too, which ride on our arms, clutching thick leather mitts. Hanging out with a dog and an eagle, riding our horse with some awesome body art, and rocking some pants. Are you excited to be a Scythian yet? We often skirmish with other tribes. As Lucian of Samosata from Syria tells us, Scythians live in a state of perpetual warfare, now invading, now receding, now contending for pasturage or booty. We sure do carry a lot of pointy objects, always ready to take aim and fire. According to the Greeks, we Scythians are the first to make iron weapons, one of the many reasons we slay so hard. But our weapon of choice is the bow and arrow. We are famous for our accuracy and range. Much like horseback riding, shooting an arrow far and fast isn't all about strength, but skill. And we're using recurve bows, which are compact and energy efficient, smaller, lighter, and more powerful than traditional bows, perfect for a fast-moving horsewoman. They look a bit like the Greek letter Sigma. Imagine a bow whose ends curve away from the archer when it's left unstrung. They take years to make. First, you have to coat a wood frame with layers of horn wrapped with horsehair or bark and glue. Then you have to leave it to season. Every step nomad has one, and it's precious, not something you'd leave lying around. Our quiver tends to be about two feet long, decorated with gold plates worked with special designs, and hangs from our hip, always ready to supply us with arrows. We think that we're probably firing some 15 to 20 arrows a minute with crazy accuracy up to, say, about 200 feet. Though a 4th century inscription praises a woman warrior for shooting an arrow some 1,700 feet. That's longer than the Empire State Building. Damn. A big part of our success as warriors is our ability to shoot a bow and arrow while galloping. Our horses are bred for both speed and endurance, and after a lifetime of practicing shooting at speed, we're quite a formidable duo. Particularly terrifying is a move called the Parthian Shot, where we turn backward on our horse as we race away, pretending to be fleeing, then turn and shoot at whoever's behind us. Just imagine it, you on a horse galloping at many miles an hour, twisting 180 degrees and shooting someone through the heart. Now that's an image. We also carry battle axes, sometimes with a bronze head. Not the kind of thing you want flying toward your cranium. Swords, daggers, spears, knives in bronze and iron. We never leave home without them. There's even evidence that we might lasso our victims, a la Wonder Woman and her shiny lasso of truth. Herodotus tells us that, with only daggers and these lassos, Scythians go about breezily, killing the victim entangled in the coils of the noose. Indiana Jones meets Xena, warrior princess. You can see why the Greeks find us both enthralling and terrifying. We also use ancient slings. Think the slingshots you may have grown up playing around with, with long-distance range and the power to take out an eye and maybe some brains with chilling efficiency. We carry shields, usually a half-moon or oval made of wicker, leather, wood, or bronze. We're also fond of huge, fancy-ass war belts. These are such a magnificent and regular feature that they may have inspired the Greek myth about Heracles going after an Amazon's fancy belt called the Belt of Ares and ending up in a bloody skirmish for it. Just because we're going to battle doesn't mean we can't look fabulous. Herodotus also tells us that we often keep gold cups dangling from our belts. We don't know why exactly they're there, but we do have some ideas. Maybe we have them in case we need to make a binding pact, called a blood oath, where we cut ourselves and drink some blood. NBD. Or maybe they hold the poison we're rumored to dip our arrows in. Either way, pretty hardcore. Let's take a very short break and get a little meta so I can tell you about the Explorese's exciting new venture. Do you love history? Are you into greeting cards and paper goods? Have you lamented how man-centric so much of history seems to be? If so, we should probably be friends. 
Also, you should check out the new Explores shop, where you'll find lady-centric timelines of bygone eras, female-focused maps, and greeting cards and art prints featuring badass women from history. Beautiful and educational, they're sure to make a great gift for a teacher, look awesome hanging over your daughter's desk, and thrill any lover of women's history. It's all printed on recycled paper in Australia, made by yours truly, and all proceeds go directly to supporting the show. So go search for the Explores on Etsy, or go to my website and click on Merchandise. When it comes to our relaxation time, apparently Scythians are quite fond of a sauna. Herodotus tells us that while not on the move, we often take a kind of vapor bath, which happens inside felt teepees full of large, hot stones. I once spent an afternoon in a sweat lodge that sounds a whole lot like this, and so I can say with confidence that if you don't like confined spaces and aren't down with being trapped in temperatures about the same level of intensity as the planet Mercury, this may not be for you. After that giant sweat fest, we might enjoy some recreational herbs. The drugs of choice around the fire are fermented mare's milk, called kumis today, and still drunk in places like Kazakhstan, and cannabis. Like ancient beer, kumis is great for we ancient ladies because it's full of vitamins and easy calories, and we're working out enough that we need lots of those. But it's also good for stirring up a party. A traveler who spends time on the step around 1250 CE says it makes the inner man most joyful. We use herbs too to find our jollies. Saka Scythian tribes use plants called Hauma and Soma. We're not sure what they are, but they're probably not far off from ancient marijuana or magic mushrooms. Pliny tells us that around Pontus, tribes collect a neurotoxic honey from the poisonous rhododendron and turn it into a kind of mead, which sounds like something we time travelers might want to drink very slowly. Hemp originated in Central Asia and was one of the first plants to be domesticated, so it's probably easy enough for us to come by. A plant called cannabis grows in Scythia, Herodotus tells us, and we weave garments from it that are just like linen. He's not entirely clear on the details in terms of which part of the plant we get high with, but he feels pretty confident we let it burn over the fire and then inhale the fumes. They keep adding more fruit to the fire and become even more intoxicated. They get so drunk on the smoke that they jump up and dance and sing around the fire. Sometimes we even do this in the felt sauna tents we're so fond of, hotboxing ourselves until, as Herodotus puts it, we howl with joy, awed and elated by their vapor bath. Some of us are even buried with a little hemp kit, just to make sure we're prepared to party in the afterlife. So while it may just be about recreation, it could also have some religious significance too. There's bound to be some dancing and singing of an evening, too. Jubilation and communion. A celebration that we've made it through another day as independent, hard-riding free spirits, free under a big sky full of stars. And then, when we're ready for bed, we might go through a few of our favorite beauty regimens. We'll mix up a mask of cedar, cypress, and frankincense, and apply it all over before hitting the sack. How we're keeping said mixture from seeping into our sheets is unclear, but apparently when we wake up, our bodies are steeped in the sweet fragrance, and their skin is clean and glossy. Go to bed smiling, Scythian lady. It's been a pretty stellar day. It's easy to see why Scythian women make such fierce and frightening figures, why they populate so many stories and myths. But the truth is that, outside of Greece, warrior women really aren't all that uncommon. Let's meet some of the real Amazon women who make the ancients tremble. <laughs> First up is Fu Hao. Over in China, at the same time Achilles and the Amazon Penthesilea are going at it at the Battle for Troy in 1200 BCE, a warrior woman named Fu Hao is born. This queen of the battlefield, whose name means Lady Good, is one of the very first women warriors we know about. Though traditional Chinese histories don't talk about her, the only reason we know her story at all is because of 250 oracle bones. 
She arrives in the world during China's Bronze Age, the daughter of a chieftain of a northwestern tribe. When she turns 15, he sends her to the emperor of the Shang Dynasty, Wu Ding, as a present for his growing harem. One among several wives, Fu Hao uses her charm and quick mind to swiftly become his favorite lady, then uses her skills and forceful personality to become her era's most powerful military general. With thousands fighting under her banner, she leads leads a huge army and enjoys even huger victories. The emperor is so impressed by her skills that he gives her a fiefdom on the borders of the kingdom to both protect and be in charge of. When she dies, her tomb is stuffed full of goodies jade, huge bronze vessels, some 1.6 metric tons of them, 27 knives, and 16 sacrificed war captives. She was far from the only woman warrior in China. We have evidence of many more during her lifetime. But her tomb lets us see what a big deal she was. Next, we move to the northeast a bit to join up with a warrior queen named Tamiris. She leads the Masagate, that free-loving, horse-riding people who, as you'll remember, leave arrows outside their tents as a sign they're engaged in carnal activities. They sacrifice their horses to the sun, wear helmets and glittering belts in brass and gold, and they aren't afraid to fight for what's theirs, no matter who they have to square up against, even if it means she has to battle per Cyrus the Great. And we have a special guest to help tell her story. Pamela Toller is the author of the fantastic book Women Warriors An Unexpected History. If you're as into women warriors as I am, you better grab yourself a copy right quick. Cyrus the Great controlled the largest land empire to date. And the next obvious place for him to take was the area that Tamiris controlled. And at the point that Cyrus the Great was ready to expand into Tamiris's territory, she ruled alone. She's squatting on prime real estate, and it's the perfect time for this powerful man to move in. He decides the best thing to do with a powerful woman is try to make her marry him so he can take her land without chopping any heads off. Seeing this move for the empty power play that it is, she declines, writing him a note that goes a little something like this. Listen, you're cute and all, but um, how about you go ahead and run your own country, and you leave me here to run mine, okay? Which, of course, he doesn't. He brings his army up to the river that divides their territory, and his men begin to build bridges across the river with obviously something other than peace in mind. And Tamiris reaches out and suggests that she and Cyrus meet one-on-one, -on -one, that he call off the bridge building, and that either her people could retreat, you know, a distance of several miles so that he could come over safely to talk to her, or she would come to him. To his credit, he actually took that suggestion to his war council. But they knock it right down because, come on, bro, it would be way too shameful, they say, to capitulate to a woman. They're going to regret that opinion later. And so the war begins. And at first, it's purely a defensive war on her part. She's trying to keep control of her territory to keep the Persians out. That was fine until her son died. Cyrus sets a trap for Tamiris's warriors, setting out a feast complete with wine and then abandoning it behind them. His hope is that these so-called barbarians will stop, as they're big fans of plunder, and that since they aren't familiar with wine, they'll get properly drunk and be ripe for the plucking. Once they've fully sunk into their wine-filled cups, Tamiris's son and his warband are ambushed. He may have been easily trapped by a banquet, but he had a clear sense of the power politics involved. So he convinced Cyrus to, un to let him be unbound, and then he killed himself so he couldn't be used as a bargaining chip. And at that point, it got personal. Tamira sends him a scathing note, letting him know in no uncertain terms that she is going to destroy him. Glutton for blood, leave my land now, or I swear by the sun, I will give you more blood than you can drink. There is a mighty battle. Herodotus, who is our main source for this, describes it as the, the most violent battle of all time. In his innocence, he couldn't imagine some of the violence that would come later. And they didn't take any prisoners. They just killed everyone. 
After the battle's over, Tamiris walks out into the fields looking for her old friend Cyrus. When she finds him, she makes sure he's decapitated. Then she dips his severed head in blood that's supposedly been drained from Persian soldiers and tells him that, just as she promised, he's now had more blood than he could drink. Damn, girl! Rumor has it that she later uses his skull as a drinking goblet. Can't say he didn't have it coming. Though not a nomadic wanderer per se, the Greeks consider women like Artemisia I a kind of Amazon, a fighter who isn't afraid to march off into war. In 480 BCE, this queen of Caria, a Greek city-state tucked into the Persian Empire, is ruling from the coastal city of Halicarnassus. And unlike her city-state neighbors, she's quite a fan of the Persians and their king. She supposedly walks around in male-style Persian dress, aka pants, because hello, and carrying a dagger and sword, always ready for action. And she knows how to use those weapons, too. The Persian king, Xerxes, is still mad at Greece for a battle he lost, so he rounds up his supporters and sets about invading them. Not someone you'd want to face down if you can avoid it. Though she's technically Greek, Artemisia sails five ships to his banner. And though she has a grown son who could have done it, she's the one who goes, because as Herodotus puts it, Her own spirit of adventure and her manly courage were her only incentives. She is Xerxes' only female admiral, and when he convenes his war council, she tells him it isn't smart to attack the Greeks at sea. But much like a man who refuses to ask for directions, he chooses not to heed her advice. And so he loses the battle, but not before Artemisia has a chance to fight bravely. Trapped on one side by Greek ships with shiny battering rams, she decides to run into one of Persia's own ships to try and break a path through to safety. Convinced she's switched sides, the Greeks leave her alone, and thus she escapes. Boys, bye! When Xerxes sees her, thinking she's just rammed one of the Greek ships instead of one of his, he throws up his hands and says, My men have turned into women, my women into men. So dangerous is she that the Greeks offer 10,000 drachmas for her capture. Good luck with that. Later, around 350 BCE, we have another Artemisia, Queen of Caria. She's known primarily for how hard she grieves her brother-husband Mausolus. It's said she misses him so much that she mixes some of his ashes into her daily drink. Ooh, girl, friend to friend, you gotta put that wine glass down. She also builds him the world's most gigantic mausoleum. It's where we get that word from, which becomes one of the seven wonders of the world. She even decorates the thing with etchings of Amazons. Foreshadowing? I think so. While she's crying into her ash-filled cup, she's also doing a bit of Amazonian warring. When she becomes queen after Mausolus dies, the island city of Rhodes decides they're not down with having a woman ruler, so they send a fleet to fight against her. No matter. She quickly gets archers up on the city walls and hides her own ships full of soldiers in a secret harbor. She gets her citizens to hail the arriving heroes, singing their praises for liberating them from the Wicked Witch. Once the Rhodians are in the city, she raises a hand and has her archers destroy them. But she doesn't stop there. Artemisia puts her own men onto the Rhodian ships, drapes them in laurel leaves, the universal sign for victory, and sails them right on back to Rhodes. The people, thinking they're waving at the men returning home victorious, welcome them in, and she has their leaders swiftly killed. Bow down, boys. Who were these warrior women, really? These so-called barbarians who weren't afraid to fight for their lives and their lands, either by horseback or sea? Were they blood-drinking, venomous man-haters? Virginal maidens on a quest to raid the world? In regards to the Scythians, as far as we can tell, they were women living life as they had always lived it, riding with the wind at their backs. The Greeks told outrageous stories about them, probably because they were trying to make sense of them. They couldn't fathom the idea of a woman riding into battle. All these centuries later, many of us still struggle with it. But when you walk back through ancient history, women are always there in the midst of every war, even if they aren't fighting it. 
Their towns are sacked, their freedom stolen, taken as slaves against their will. I, for one, like knowing that some of them grew up learning how to fight and unafraid to do so. Women were touched by war then and always, so give them a chance to fight if they have to and fight well. I wonder how many women in Athens daydreamed about Amazons, filled to the brim with thrill and wonder. How many of them looked at their images on the sides of their wedding vases and felt a little bit more powerful? Just that little bit more wild. There were plenty of real-life warrior women for them to be inspired by. This may be the first time we've run into fighting women this season, but it's definitely not going to be the last. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you dig the Explorers, tell a friend, leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, or spread the word however you can. It really does make a world of difference. You can also support the show by becoming a patron, which gives you access to sneak peeks and exclusive bonus episodes, including an awesome interview I did with today's guest, Pamela Toller. Her book, Women Warriors, is an engrossing read that'll introduce you to a host of interesting women warriors throughout history, and I can't recommend it highly enough. For show notes, including a list of my research sources, a transcript, images, and more, head on over to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. Speaking of pictures, check me out on Instagram. I think you'll find my Insta game is pretty strong. You can also find me on Twitter at the Explores Pod or Facebook at the Explores Podcast. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael B. Levy, who composes all of his work on recreated lyres of antiquity, giving us a special insight into what ancient music might have sounded like. All songs were provided and licensed by AKMProductionsInc.com and you can find links to his work in the show notes. A special thanks to the following podcast legends who kindly contributed their vocal stylings. Tawny from the Dirty Bits podcast, which covers the scandalous and salacious bits of history your teacher probably left out. Katie and Nathan from Queen's Podcast, who will make you laugh and cry over badass women from history. Jen and Jenny from Ancient History Fangirl, which takes you deep into the stories of the ancient world. And Sean from Stories of Your and Yours, who tells you classic stories in the most soothing voice you'll ever hear. Their podcasts are some of my very favorites, so check them out. You'll find links to their work in the show notes. Thanks also to the kind friends and family who never fail to delight me with their voiceovers, Phil Chevalier and John Armstrong. Thanks, as always, to Paul Gablonski, a.k.a. Mr. Explores, for my theme music and logo, and all the amazing pieces of art we've been collaborating on this season. I'd pick up my Spartan sword for you any day. Mm-hmm.